And where we do get some sunny spells, it will feel warm. High UV at this time of year when the sun does come out. But into the evening, well, that's when we see the cloud really break up as drier and clearer air arrives for a time. One exception towards the west, the weather will continue to be fairly cloudy with some further showers. And the northeast of Scotland continuing to see the low cloud and the mist, especially near the beaches. Then Thursday morning starts off with spells of cloud and showers working their way from the west. Some more prolonged rain for a time for Northern Ireland, for example. And then by the afternoon, again, it's a mixture of sunny spells and hefty downpours with thunderstorms in one or two spots. Friday showers mostly confined to the south. Drier and brighter conditions arrive from the north for the start of the weekend. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. That's yes, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, good evening, it's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The alleged royal Rwanda bust-up. Is it true that the King took a side on the Rwanda debate? Constitutionally, his neutrality is fundamental. Well, we have the perfect man to help us make sense of the speculation. Is mass migration here to stay? Experts have warned the latest Home Office figures reveal Britain is on track to reach net migration of 675,000 this year. All as the BBC often used to say, in spite of Brexit. Further developments in the Coronation Day protester arrest controversy. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner now claims many demonstrators armed with white paint were planning to disrupt the King's big day, disguising themselves as stewards 
intending to cause chaos. So I will debate this with a staunch Republican. Were the police's actions justified? And inheritance tax. Is it time this unpopular tax died? Vox Populi Vox Day. that is the question we have asked the great people of Northern Ireland. And here's a taste of what they had to say. I think 90% of tax should be done away. The British public sound as a pound sterling. Also, the rape trial of former US President Donald Trump is expected to announce a verdict imminently. We will bring you more as it happens. State of the Nation starts now. We'll also be joined by our esteemed panel, political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and the author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole. As ever, I want to hear from you. It's the most important part of the programme. Email me, you know this off by heart by now, mailmog at gbnews.uk. But now it's time for a swift refresh of the news with Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you, and good evening to you. The top story tonight on GB News. The Information Commissioner's Office says it won't be taking any action against Lancashire Police over the disclosure of Nicola Bully's personal information. The force came under some criticism after the 45-year-old's body was discovered in the River Wire in February following a three-week search. Meanwhile, the police watchdog, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, also says it's identified two areas of learning after the force had contact with Nicola Bully in the days before she went missing. An independent review by the College of Policing into the handling of the case is underway. Its recommendations will be published in the autumn. Now, the Met Police Commissioner has defended his forces policing of the coronation after some criticism for the arrest of six protesters ahead of the event. Sir Mark Rowley described the arrests as unfortunate, but stressed he supports the arresting officers' actions. The force confirmed the individuals face no further action after being stopped under the new Public Order Act. The Prime Minister has today said he supports people's right to protest, but says the new laws are needed to protect against serious disruption. Pharmacists will be able to give prescription medicines without a GP sign-off in the latest government plans to ease the pressure on doctors. Under the measures, patients will be able to get treatments for seven common conditions, including a sore throat and ear infections, without seeing a doctor. It's hoped the new guidelines, which will come into place this winter, will free up up to 15 million appointments at surgeries over the next two years. Rishi Sunak says the measures will also help cut waiting times for those seeking medical help. Now, a marine barge which will be used to house migrants has arrived in UK waters. It's called the Bibby Stockholm. It docked in Falmouth this morning. It's going to be refurbished ahead of its use as a housing centre. The three-storey barge will be used for at least 18 months and can hold up to 500 people as they wait for their asylum claims to be processed. It's part of a government scheme to move asylum seekers away from costly hotel accommodation. And ambulance workers in the southeast have been striking today as their union escalated its industrial action over pay. Unite's members employed at South Central and South East Coast Ambulance Services will continue to strike until 10 o'clock tonight. Last month, the members rejected the government's offer of a lump sum cash payment and a 5% pay rise. Members of the other health unions accepted the same offer. And lastly, thunderstorms have been sweeping through the UK today, causing disruption for road users and some travellers. The Met Office earlier issued a yellow weather warning, which is going to be in place for another hour tonight until 10 o'clock. It covers most of southern England, East Anglia and parts of the Midlands. It added there could be some damage to property caused by flash flooding. That weather warning in place for another two hours, actually, until 10 o'clock. You're up to date on TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and the TuneIn app. This is GB News, the People's Channel. An exciting story from the former number 10 communications director, Gita Harry, who says that when Boris Johnson was the Prime Minister, the good old days, we sound the music and the trumpets, he and the then Prince of Wales, now the King, King Charles III, had what diplomats like to call a full and frank exchange of views. 
translate into a big row over the government's Rwanda scheme. Apparently, the king referred to the scheme as appalling. It is, of course, worth noting that the Daily Mail also reported that other sources close to Boris Johnson deny this. And I, being a source not entirely unclose to Boris Johnson, haven't asked him. So I don't know other than what I've heard from Geetone in the papers. But it raises questions. As Prince of Wales, the king expressed a variety of views, many of which I agreed with. I strongly agreed with the king on his architectural views, on the terrible damage modern architecture has done. I think that Poundbury is one of the most inspirational planning schemes in the country, and that if we had more planning like Poundbury, our house-building problem wouldn't be on the scale that it is. But as king, His Majesty must remain above politics, that the neutrality of our sovereign is fundamental to how a constitutional monarchy works. The late Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, was remarkably good at this. Nobody knew what her views were, and when a headline said she was in favour of Brexit, this was swiftly denied by the palace. Nobody ever wanted to trespass on Her Late Majesty's political views, and she kept her opinions very much to herself, because the monarch must not allow personal views to become public property. The constitutional monarch is the focus of all our loyalty and of all our support. We may be reporting later on Donald Trump. We sometimes report on Joe Biden. They are politically divisive figures who you may like or you may dislike. But a constitutional monarch needs to be liked, loved indeed, by us all. And that requires political neutrality. And this is potentially going to be more difficult for the king with regard to green policies. Parliament's debating today an energy bill that is going to put more costs onto the British people. But the king should not be seen either to support this or to oppose it. And it'll be interesting to see how the current Prince of Wales behaves. Obviously, as Prince of Wales, he's got more freedom. But as Prince of Wales is tends to become king by the general passing of time, people may remember views that he had in the past. And there are difficulties with that if people then assume that the sovereign has political opinions. But, of course, we want to hear from you. If you were a fly on the wall and saw this bust-up between the then Prime Minister and the then Prince of Wales, particularly email me, mailmog at gbnews.uk. But I'm not particularly delighted to be joined by, I think, our greatest constitutional expert, um, who's also a friend of mine, uh, Sir Vernon Bogdaner. Um, Sir Vernon, thank you so much for coming on. Are you worried about anything that the Prince of Wales said when he was... The King said when he was Prince of Wales... Or do you think that chapter closes and now, um, as king, as long as he's politically neutral, it's fine? I, I'm not at all worried. Uh, as you said, Jacob, uh, he made a number of controversial comments when he was Prince of Wales, but they weren't controversial in party political terms. I mean, his general habit was to take up an issue which he thought important but if it was then taken up by the political parties, he would withdraw. He made his point, and it was then up to the political parties if they so wished to develop it. I don't think you can take any case where he said something that was partisan. And the question about architecture um, excites many differences, profound differences, but they're not matters of party political division. So I, I don't have any worries at all. And after all, he's known from his earliest years, unlike the late Queen, that he would be king. So he's well aware of what the constitutional tradition requires, as you yourself uh, explained it. Uh, and um, you think that with his green views, that they obviously do have a party political element. There is, after all, a green party that expressing broad concern and support for the environment is fine, as long as he doesn't say we must therefore do X, Y and Z and put forward a manifesto or a programme of action. Absolutely right. It's important to notice that now that he's king, all his speeches and actions, except for his Commonwealth Day broadcast and his Christian Christmas Day broadcast, are on the advice of ministers. So he can't um, speak in a kind of freer way that he did when he was Prince of Wales. And, of course, he's well aware of that convention of the Constitution. So I really don't think there's any cause for worry. And I must say, I think this spat about Rwanda is really uh, not a story. It's 
a rather ephemeral storm in a very small teacup, frankly. Well, it may be an effort to sell a podcast. I, I must confess, when I read that they had squared up to each other, that didn't have the ring of truth about it um, in the case of either man. I can't think that um, Boris Johnson would have dreamt of squaring up against his future sovereign. It's one person saying what happened between two other people when he wasn't present. So I think we can take it all with a pinch of salt. And um, uh, this was a report on what Boris Johnson said. Boris Johnson has an enormous number of virtues, but strict accuracy and precision aren't perhaps the ones one would first think about. And anyway, this hasn't come from Boris. It's come from his former communications director. Um, and there were very occasional issues, weren't there, when the Queen was thought to have expressed a view. There was the famous one when the Sunday Times reported that she was very cross with Margaret Thatcher over sanctions on South Africa and the Commonwealth. Did you feel that that report was constitutionally risky, or was that because it was the Commonwealth within the ambit of what a constitutional monarch can do? You raise a very interesting point here, that as well as being Queen of Britain, Queen of Australia, Canada, Jamaica, and so on, the Queen was also head of the Commonwealth, and the King is head of the Commonwealth. Now, as head of the Commonwealth, the King is not subject to advice. It's not a constitutional role, but that mustn't be seen as a mere extension of being King of Britain, or it will be seen as a return of imperialism, a return of empire, if you like. So, Charles has concerns that go beyond being King of Britain. And it may be that if he did say anything in private about Rwanda, he was thinking in terms of the role of head of the Commonwealth and not as King of Britain. It does require great skill to keep these two roles distinct. The late Queen showed that skill, and I believe Charles will show it as well. It's very difficult for the government as well, because the government has to understand this constitutional nicety that the king is the king of several other countries and head of the Commonwealth, and he could conceivably be getting conflicting advice from the different prime ministers. There was actually the issue with um, the last COP in Egypt, wasn't there, where uh, I think the prime minister of Australia said, well, I would advise his majesty to go, and it seemed as if the prime minister of the United Kingdom was advising his majesty not to go. Well, the Prime Minister of Australia advises the Governor-General of Australia, who is the King's representative there. There is no direct relationship with the King, so the danger of conflicting advice is very small. But you're right to point this out in a way, because some years ago, the Queen, as Queen of Belize, was opening the Parliament of Belize and reading the Queen's speech. And the Queen's speech in Belize said that imprisoning offenders was not the right way or the best way to deal with the rising crime rate. Now, at that time, the policy of the British government, when Michael Howard was Home Secretary in the 1990s, was precisely the opposite, that this was a good way of dealing with rising crime. So it requires a lot of tact and care to make the relationship work. And the examples you gave about Margaret Thatcher and the Queen were related to her role as head of the Commonwealth, when the Commonwealth, or most members of the Commonwealth, took a different view from Margaret Thatcher about sanctions against South Africa. Yes, and everybody accepts that. So the political nation understands this, but gets excited by the occasional leaks of royal views, hence the Sun headline that the Queen was in favour of Brexit, which, of course, was very powerfully denied. I think Gita Harry's point on Rwanda was that this um, line wasn't denied by the Prince of Wales, as he then was. Well, there is always gossip about uh, the royal family. And if they spent their time denying every rumour about them, they would have time, I think, for little else. So the fact that it wasn't denied, I think, doesn't really mean very much. But if it was said, and I have no idea whether it was or not, it was said privately, and no one has any right to reveal the private conversations between the Prince of Wales, as he then was, and the Prime Minister, or, or any other head of state, for that matter. Brit Vernon, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing your expertise to the viewers of GB News. Uh, coming up next, we have a verdict coming live from New York on Mr Donald Trump. And we'll be bringing you the results with GB News' very own Nigel Farage and Republican candidate Carrie Lake. This will be so exciting, you will be glued to your television set.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, it's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob Rees-Mogg, and this is State of the Nation. You've been getting in touch with your thoughts. John says, the only way we will stop the boats is to use the Royal Navy to turn them round in French waters. That's the spirit. And an anonymous GB viewer says, your guest read Charles saying things when he was prince. Your guest is wrong. Charles made a blazing comment at the WEF. Sir Vernon Bogdan is very rarely wrong, but... Thank you for those. Um, we said we'd bring some updates about the Donald Trump civil case. The jury, deliberating in the rape trial of Donald Trump, has found the former US president not guilty of the rape charges made against him. The civil lawsuit was brought by writer E. Jean Carroll, who accused Mr. Trump of raping her in a Manhattan department store in the 1990s. The verdict was returned as not guilty on rape charges. However, it did find that he sexually abused her. The ex-president was also found to have defamed Miss Carroll in a Truth Social post in 2022. The jury has awarded Miss Carroll $20,000 in punitive damages for battery claims against Mr. Trump, along with $2.7 million in compensatory damages for defamation by Mr. Trump. The total amount of damages awarded to Miss Carroll is $5 million, so that's about £4 million. Um, I'm now joined by the US midterm Republican candidate for Arizona, and support of Mr. Trump, Carrie Lake, and our very own Nigel Farage. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for coming in. And 
Uh, as it's not a British election, I think without breaking any rules, I can wish you very good luck. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, but tell me, what does this mean for the Republican Party? What's it mean for Mr. Trump's presidential head? Well, I think people who are following politics in America know they're seeing what's happening. They're trying to line up as many lawsuits as they can against President Trump. This is part of their, what has now gone on for eight years, a barrage of negativity and, in, in many cases, media lying and defaming the president. And now... He's getting found guilty by a jury in New York, one of the most liberal cities in, in the world, frankly, in the country for sure. And we've, we've seen just uh, you know, a constant witch hunt of this man. I think they're trying to set things up going into the election where he looks so damaged that they try to convince even a few voters here and a few voters there that they're just exhausted with him and they need to move on. And, and I don't believe that the people will move on from President Trump that easily. Do you think this is undermining confidence in the American legal system? Our legal system is a mess right now. Obviously, you can look at what they've done to President Trump. They've got the DOJ going after him. They have the DA in New York City going after him. They don't even go after murderers in some cases in New York, but they're going after President Trump, left and right, left and right. You're seeing it constantly. And I'll tell you what, this is dangerous. I, I'm a mother of a boy of a young man, and this is a dangerous time. If, if somebody can just throw this out there from allegedly happened 30 years ago and accuse you of something like that, drag your name through the mud, and because of our judicial system being such a wreck right now where there is not parity and fairness, ruin you and, but, and financially ruin you, it's dangerous for all men in our country. And are Republicans doing it to Democrat candidates and political figures, or is it working very much one way? It's very much one way, but right now what we're seeing is a uniparty. There's even some Republicans in that uniparty. It is the political apparatus, the political elite that's been running the show in America for decades, and they do not like an outsider like Donald Trump. So we have a uniparty made up of primarily Democrats, but also some Republicans who are really starting to, you know, go after the America First candidates. America first candidates are a threat to that system because we're going to stop feeding the beast of Washington, D.C. and the swamp and start addressing the concerns of everyday Americans who have been left on the sidelines struggling while the political elite continue to pad their pockets and line their pockets. So, Nigel, this is the U.S. equivalent of the blob, but you saw President Trump very recently. Yeah. What Was he in good spirits? Was he expecting this? Was this sort of par for the course for... I would say his mood last week up at Turnberry, one of quiet anger. Uh, quiet anger is good, because you can turn quiet anger into a positive as opposed to rage, which never leads to anything good. Uh, I think he knew that one or two of these things were coming down the track. On the bigger picture, you know, when the Americans had the War of Independence and broke away, they didn't like George III much. I was joking earlier, nor did we particularly. But when they set up the American Constitution, they chose to take the best from our country, and they genuinely did, and they wrote a brilliant document. But the common law system they took from us, they have completely and utterly corrupted. I mean, how can you be sued for defamation, for putting out statements defending yourself ahead of a trial? I mean, I find that... It's extraordinary. Terrible. The plea bargaining system in America, when 98% of cases that go to court finish up with plea bargain, guilty verdicts. Something has gone very wrong with the common law system in America, and that has allowed it to become intensely politicised. I mean, surely a judge in a civil case, as this was, or a criminal case, would say to a jury that if you're going to convict on any of these charges... You have to prove in your minds beyond reasonable but, but doubt. But you don't in a civil case. That's the whole point. Well, in a civil yeah. case, it's balance of probability. Yes, but I still think... But I still think, Jacob, I still think, you know, I still think that anybody sitting on a jury in an even-handed way would say, where's the evidence? And why did it take her 23 years to report it? I, I, I find the whole... Well, I mean, in, in America, unlike here, people can speak to the jurors and find out why they thought what they thought and why they came to their decision. But don't you think the Republicans must take some of the blame too? Because they have put any number of Republican judges in the federal system and therefore the politicisation of um, the legal system in the US is not just a Democrat. No, it's not. You're absolutely right. And of course, you know, Donald Trump had the opportunity to get a conservative majority, you know, you know there on the Supreme Court because that fell into his lap. Um, yeah, look, their judiciary has become too politicised. 
these are the consequences mm -hmm. of it, and I think America needs fundamental change of its legal system. I think Americans are distraught right now looking at our judicial system saying it is so uneven, it is so unlevel, that there's no way that they, if they are on the conservative side, the America first type conservatives, that if they ever got caught up in the system that they could get a fair shake. And that's a dangerous place to be when the majority or a large portion of the, of the population looks at the judicial system and says it is rigged against us and we can't trust in it. And it undermines democracy, doesn't it? Because if you lose at the ballot box, you go to court. Right. And we've seen this in the UK in terms of judicial reviews and so on and so forth. But that's civil and that's against the government. It's not against individuals so much. In the US, it's much more visceral. That, um, I mean, you go back to the uh, impeachment of Nixon, the impeachment of Clinton, that you lose the election and therefore you go for an impeachment. And the impeachment of Trump followed. And that judicialization of politics, even if very justified in certain cases, has to an extent poisoned the well. Well, this is, this is in the New York courts as well. New York is a liberal state. They have an incredibly liberal folks working in the judicial system. And then you have a jury, an anonymous jury. They never, they were, their names were kept out. Uh, you know, nobody can interview them. I suppose they could come forward now. And you've got people in New York who've been poisoned against President Trump for eight years, nonstop negative coverage. They literally hate the man and they're sitting on the jury. How do you get a fair shake? How do you get a fair jury in a, a, a situation like that. It's all very bad for America, though, isn't it? You know, the Truly. divisions in America are very, very frightening. Um, a big warning to us, Jacob, here, I think. Well, one of the occasions when we mustn't follow our cousins across the Atlantic. Absolutely. Thank you both <laughs> uh, very much. Um, during, the, during the Brexit referendum, how many times did we hear from the BBC in spite of Brexit? Quoting myself is probably a sign of great vanity, but I said this on Question Time a few years ago. The, 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 the BBC, how many times have we heard in spite of Brexit? In spite of Brexit, a record three million jobs have been created since 2010. In spite of Brexit, unemployment is its lowest level since 1975. Kind of in spite of Brexit, England defeated the West Indies at Lords. I mean, it is... <laughs> it, it, it is again and again. Well, borrowing from the BBC, although for slightly different reasons, in spite of Brexit, net immigration has been forecast to reach 675,000 this year. That's double the pre-Brexit record of 330,000 nearly a decade ago. As you may know, I'm a sceptic of forecasts, but in this instance, we don't need one. The evidence is clear. In the year to June 2022, net immigration to the United Kingdom was over half a million. And this is with a Conservative government steering the ship. Ever since, an unequivocal mandate for lower immigration in the 2016 referendum. It's also worth mentioning David Cameron promised in 2010 to bring immigration down from the hundreds of thousands to the tens of thousands. And this continued pledge is a key reason why Conservatives have maintained power for the past 13 years. And yet, this conclusively and repeatedly emphasised mandate is not being implemented. All the time, all time record migration in spite of Brexit. We must remember that mass immigration is not inevitable. It is an historical aberration against our traditions that we will soon have to correct. We have a densely populated country. We're not building enough houses it simply isn't possible to maintain such numbers. But I'm particularly pleased to be joined this evening by the founder of the think tank, New Culture Forum, Peter Whittle. Peter. Hello, Jacob. 675,000. That's pretty high when we promised into the tens of thousands. Yes, it's uh, just absurd. It's a terrible figure. Um, I think that it will amount to, if it goes on like that, and why should we doubt that it will, it'll go on, it'll mean another two million people you know, over the next few years. Uh, that's a population that's already gone up by something like 8 million in the past 10 years. Um, and I think really what it shows, Jacob, is a total and utter lack of will on the part, uh, as you say, of the Conservative Party, but before that, it, you know, Labour, um, to actually really address the, an issue, and which in, is of most importance to most people. In very simplistic terms, we had a target of 300,000 houses to be built. Yeah. With 675,000 net migration, that means we are short of houses, even if we'd built the 300,000 that we um, failed to build anyway. Yes. Uh, actually, density slightly lower, um, uh, with, or higher with migrants than it is with um, people already here. But nonetheless, we're not building the houses, we don't have the infrastructure, it's just putting a strain on what is already there. Well, exactly. 
all these questions that we talk about on programs like this channel, housing, the NHS, all of these things, um, they all become meaningless if you do not talk about immigration at the same time. I mean, you, you've got the most extraordinary levels, as you pointed out, sort of un, you know, unprecedented historically. This is, this is not just migration. <coughs> this, as you said, is mass migration. It's now being sort of confused, if you like, in the public discourse. Uh, you're either for it or you're against it. In fact, there is migration, which we used to have until about 1997, of around 50,000 a year net. And now we are having, we're talking about half a million last year, 675,000 this year. Um, this has got to be broken. That, that link between just migration, reasonable migration, and mass migration of a kind which is, will change the country irrevocably. Well, uh, and irrespective of the changes it may bring, it's simply not having the facilities here for the people to come, the doctor surgeries. And we have a big announcement today on easing the pressure of doctor services. But if the population has gone up by 8 to 10 million in the last 10 years, well, of course, or 20 years, of course doctor services are being pressurised because there are more people who need the services. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, there are these economic problems, massive economic problems. Um, I think that the, the basic problem here, though, uh, Jacob, is that, you know, people have been deceived. I'd say that over the past, certainly in the, over the past three years, uh, they were told with Brexit that actually migration would be kept under control. That seems to have been changed by sort of dissembling, I think, to, to actually, oh, what we were actually going to do was just take, take back control. We were just mm -hmm. going to control. Uh, but in fact, people voted for Brexit on the understanding that this kind of numbers would come down. Um, and in fact, what has happened over the past three or four years is that all the uh, entry requirements have actually been eased. And that seems to be being carried on by Sunak. OK, but the two points on that. One is we may be getting more accurate numbers now, because as you will know, um, it was expected there would be two million people who would apply for EU settled status, and it turned out being six million. So we hadn't been counting them in the first place. And so it may not be that much worse than it was before. And the second issue is how would we have done economically without the labour force that's been coming in? Who would have been working in our care homes and in our hospitals and building our roads and our houses? We've got five million people on uh, out-of-work benefits, Jacob. And the fact is, is that what has happened is that working class people in this country uh, have effectively been abandoned. Uh, what this is more or less saying, by looking at these figures and saying this is what actually we've got to come to accept as being the new normal, is there isn't going to be retraining, people aren't going to be paid properly. It's like we've abandoned that whole model and we're just simply going to keep bringing people in to do these jobs. So. What that really means is that you've given up on your own population. Um, I think that is one of the well, worst things that's happened politically in the past three decades. Nobody in their right mind would ever give up on the people of North East Somerset, but thank you uh, very much. Um, next, we're going on to inheritance tax. The great British public spend their whole lives working, taxed at every corner, at every opportunity. Money is extracted from them, whether it's on their income, on their spending, on their homes or energy bills. And just when they go to meet their maker, they make that appointment for the heavenly chorus and intend to pass on their accumulated wealth to their heirs and successors in law. The greedy, unsatiated state swoops in one last final time and takes a rapacious 40% of everything over £325,000. Nothing conservative about inheritance tax. Ultimately, it's an attack on the family by the state. As you can imagine, it's terribly unpopular. And as it happens, abolishing this policy wouldn't be all that expensive. It raises remarkably little tax and is a particularly unpopular one. It yields 0.7% of overall government receipts. So scrapping it is perfectly feasible. Anyway, enough of what I think. You probably could have guessed it anyway. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. We asked the British people if they think we should abolish inheritance tax. And the people have spoken. Yes. It would leave that the farms can be handed on down to the individual that they want them to go to. It would leave it that the uh, affordable to that person to take over that farm and run it. Absolutely. Well, you pay tax on something once when you buy it. You pay tax on something once when you earn it. And if you buy anything in between, you pay tax on that as well. 
So why pay tax again when you die? Yes, when people work for themselves and work hard and make money and employ people and do all those things and pay their taxes, why should you be taxed when you want to give that to someone else? I think 90% of tax should be done away. And I'm delighted that my very good-natured and erudite panel, the political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and the author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole, are still with me. They weren't too put out by the fact that we didn't come to them on the um, last subject. Um, Amy, inheritance tax, is it very unfair to double-dip on people and take well, money out of them a second time? I know it's very emotive, but I personally could not see it as a double-dip because let's break it down. It's unearned wealth. The person who's receiving it hasn't paid tax on it. And the really important thing is only 4% of people in the UK will pay any inheritance tax. So we're really talking about a real minority and it makes £7 billion for the Treasury. So what I would say to you, Jacob, is if you can plug that £7 billion elsewhere, then do away with it. But we can't afford to lose it. But it has already been taxed because it's people's own money. It's not the state's money. Well, to say how it's distributed, it's my money. And surely people like me work for the benefit of their children. That's why we um, get up in the morning and earn our living. I agree, but you are a patriot, aren't you? And I would say, what could be more patriotic than having the heir as the state? Oh, I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> I, I think the state squanders billions every the year. The country needs and therefore... that money, and we, we want to tackle that inequality and encourage social mobility. And surely having a big chunk of unearned wealth isn't good for anyone. What do you think? Well, I think uh, it, it is double-dipping, because although the people who inherit the um, money don't pay the tax on it, it, it's the people who have gone out to work hard and built up that estate to, to pass on to their family. It's about uh, incentivising um, hard work. And, it's, and I think it actually goes to the heart of what a Conservative government should be about. Whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the people who work hard uh, and try and look after their family? And I think if Rishi Sunak wants to uh, make an offer to voters next time round, I think he should consider this because, as you say, Jacob, it is a very unpopular tax. There, there, are, only, um, it's, there are only two taxes that are more unpopular than this. The top being the BBC licence fee, fee yes. uh, and then the, the second being fuel duty. And although not many people are actually caught by uh, inheritance tax, people feel very angry about it because it, it is inherently unfair. It is, em it is an emotive one. Well, I it's completely also, appreciate it's that. It's also effectively a voluntary tax, because if you give your money away and live for seven years, then you're not caught by it. So it's always said that inheritance tax is only paid by those people who trust the inland revenue less than they trust their family. But I can't say enough, this affects 4% of people and most people will not pay inheritance tax, even worsened by the fact of the social care crisis. Like, we are more likely to spend £100,000 on our social care, which leaves most people with no inheritance to leave behind. But the number who have been paying has been going up recently and the tax take's been rising quite sharply because of increasing property values. Yes. And this makes it even harder for people in the south of England for their children to get on the property ladder because they lose a lot of their inheritance. It totally admittedly needs reform. And would you agree that if it was fairer to have an almost gradient of, rather than a threshold... So it, it was intended to be the top earners that paid inheritance tax, right? So if we could make it more in line with house prices, then would you say that it's, it's a welcome tax? No, I, I mean, I agree with your point. You have to raise tax to pay for what the government wishes to do. I think a 40% rate on capital is always wrong because you force people to sell family homes. Do you remember the case about the two sisters who lived together? One of them died. The other sister who lived in the house for 80 years is forced to move out. It, it's, it's too high for a capital tax. To have a transaction tax, a stamp duty, is perhaps more reasonable. And I think so. you've, got, you've got to remember as well, the most wealthy people in this country... They will avoid, they find ways to avoid paying um, inheritance tax. What this really does hit is the people, middle income people, who've really put everything into building up a, a, a nice family home, something to pass on to their families. It's those people who are, are hit by this. And £325,000 sounds an enormous amount, but actually the, the, the threshold has been frozen, frozen for so long that so many people now are paying. Um, so many more thousands of people are paying this than they were a decade ago. Um, that, that I think the Conservative government really ought to be looking at this as an issue. And I think, actually, you know, if you want to 
help families. If you want to, you don't want families having to kind of game the system to try and work out how, you know, have you got seven years left <laughs> to live? I mean, that's a perverse way to, to, to kind of deal with this issue. I mean, I would be in favour of abolishing the tax because I think it's um, expensive to collect. It needs masses of anti-avoidance legislation. If you live seven years, you get rounded anyway. And 0.7% of government expenditure, we could save that by making the government even fractionally more efficient. It's not a difficult amount to extract from spending. OK, but I know that tax cuts are like catnip to you. But <laughs> what about the lowest rate of income tax? Can we cut that tax? Well, I was strongly in favour of raising the income tax threshold, which I think was a, the best thing the coalition government did, because we have a ridiculous system where the least well-off in society pay lots of tax. They still do, but they pay it in indirect taxes. And the issue there is what you do about um, tobacco and alcohol taxes, because they're there for more than tax collection reasons. I think if people were getting value for money, they wouldn't mind paying a bit more tax at any point. But at the moment, we have the highest tax burden since World War II and probably some of the worst public services, certainly the worst public services that I've seen in my lifetime. And I think that makes this even more emotive because we feel like we're throwing money into a void. This is turning into a worrying level of agreement because <laughs> there's nothing I can dispute on that. People feel they're paying lots of tax and they can't get a passport well, and they can't get any sense out of DVLA and they can't get anything from the land registry. I, I, I would agree on that, but I think you've got, you've got to look at the issue there, which is we keep paying more and more and more tax and we keep getting worse and worse public services. And that's, that is a, a, a big problem. I don't know why people would continue to pay higher rates of tax for worse levels of service. And you have to then look at who's running the services and what, why they are swallowing up such huge amounts of money and well, not providing value for the taxpayer. I think people are working from home. Um, but up next... I'm Get looking, over it. I, I'm looking forward... <laughs> that'll take a long time. Up next, I'm looking forward... I'm being heckled by my own guest. Up next, I'm looking forward to talking to an, an abolitionist about some of the more tumultuous moments of the otherwise splendid Coronation Weekend we've just enjoyed. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight, loose women legend Carol McGiffin breaks her silence after reports her views on COVID were behind her axing, spelling the end of two decades on the infamous panel show. Has woke ITV made a nasty habit of censoring its biggest stars, or is there more to the story? Carol speaks out exclusively on Dan Wooten tonight, 9 to 11 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians 
to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, and this is still State of the Nation. You've been getting in touch with your male mogs. Claire says, What they're doing in America against Trump is exactly what's happening over here with Boris Johnson. Both are just a witch hunt. Ben, it's important for His Majesty the King never to be involved in politics. If ever he did, then the monarchy would be in jeopardy. His mother was an expert in not getting involved. She may have had her own views, but these were kept to herself, hence the name Queen of Queens. Neil... If the monarch cannot express a political view, what does he actually do as a constitutional monarch? Nothing, right? No, that's not right. He sees the Prime Minister once a week, and in that meeting, he can say whatever he likes to the Prime Minister. Anyway, I'm naturally pleased, as I imagine many of you are, that last week all went smoothly, other than the occasional bump in the road. But the Metropolitan Police has once again found itself caught in controversy. Metropolitan Police officers divided opinion by arresting six anti-monarchy protesters on Coronation Day, leading to accusations of quashing free speech from some and others proclaiming that prevention of disruption was entirely justified on such a monumental day when the whole world was watching us. Today, police chief Sir Mark Rowley provided a new development in the controversy, claiming that several disguised individuals shrouded as stewards' attire were armed with white paint and intended to cause criminal damage on that important day. So how justified were the police's actions? Are we seeing an erosion of one of the fundamental pillars of a free society? Or was such action justified to prevent Britain's international humiliation on the day of our sovereign's anointing? Well, I'm really pleased to be joined by the contributing editor of Navarra Media and a supporter of abolishing the monarchy, Michael Walker. And partly I'm pleased to have you on, because although I don't agree with you on abolishing the monarchy, this is a free country and you have a right to express that view and you have the right to express it on Saturday, but how do you as a Republican think the police on that of all days should have got the balance right if you think they didn't? Uh, well, I think they didn't. And I, I, I'm interested actually in this argument. People say, oh, they're in a difficult position. The whole world was watching. This was a monumental occasion. Now, cast your mind back to 2008. So there was the Beijing Olympics. And do you remember that all of the controversy, oh, the Chinese government are not letting the Tibetan protesters protest the Olympics. Now, I'm sure you would have heard a similar story from the Chinese Communist Party, which is to say, that, you know, the whole world is watching. This is the Olympics. We do not want this to be disrupted. The people of our country want to enjoy this. They don't want to see protesters. But I think quite rightly and quite understandably, the rest of the world said, no, it's precisely at this kind of moment that you should be allowing protesters. And I think here it's exactly the same thing. Obviously, a coronation, uh, you know, I think people had absolutely the right to enjoy it, but people also had the right to hold up placards and say, we don't believe in the monarchy, which was what those people who were arrested wanted to do. Also, one other thing I want to say, just because I think it does make it a bit more powerful, you know, what's gone wrong here. It wasn't just six protesters, it was the leader of the, the leading Republican group. So, You've been in so touch it, with the Metropolitan Police and had agreed that the protest would be peaceful. Absolutely. It does seem very unfortunate that he, of all people, should have been stopped. Well, unfortunate is one word for it. I think there are different... I think you can be a little bit more cynical than that. And especially because they were held for 16 hours, right? And it seems very obvious, you know, the police now have apologised and said, oh, we thought they were going to lock on with some, you know, the kind of tags that you would hold a placard together with. So the kind of thing that the police would be able to snip off in a second if someone was trying a movement. Obviously, the reason people lock on with D-locks is because it's quite difficult to get them mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. If you were to lock on to something with a small plastic cable, then that's not going to be a very effective form I don't of know. direct I've never action, tried it. is it? Um, and, but that was the issue. There was a Republican protest, which these six were going to join. That was already going ahead, um, and quite properly that was was allowed. I do just wonder if you are... Well, was putting... it allowed? So I think that's another important point. So 
What was taken from them was amplification equipment. They also warned a Labour MP not to turn up and speak, by the way. So Clive Lewis was warned, don't turn up because there's some sort of security threat. Now, many people in Republic, in that organisation, think that that was maybe uh, a little bit disingenuous of the police because maybe they didn't want an MP speaking there. And their equipment was taken away. So obviously, if you have a demonstration, you want to have some amplification equipment so you can have speeches. Now, if the police have taken away well, the leader of the group Gabs, and they've taken Gabs away the speakers, you can't then say, well, not everyone is as, as powerful as Come on, as him. people There's can more project their voice. Well, they I, not I mean, here, it, it, but, uh, this, I mean, this is a bit I, by I, the by. I, I, actually, the, the key I, elements of their protest, which was the leader of their movement, and ordinary things yeah. that one has at a protest, but they had, speakers, they had was taken said, from them. <coughs> they had said amplification wasn't allowed, and that seems to be perfectly reasonable, that Steve Bray, to be fair to him, has an amazing parade ground voice and is able to express his views fiercely without amplification. Are That's we, we, we going to decide how, how much someone can participate in democratic debate depending on the, the power of their lungs? It seems a little bit uh, well, arbitrary I, to me. I, I think that not allowing amplification is, is a reasonable But that constraint. wasn't what they'd agreed with the police. So, obviously, and I think it's important to that, note... That was the law that had just come in, that, that limited amplification. Well, limited amplification, yeah. And, I mean, I think that's a terrible law, by the way. Oh, I that, think it's, also, yes. it's also very notable that this happened two days after the government yeah, yeah. rushed through a law, the Public Order Act, which everyone said was going to be abused. Everyone said, this is an incredibly vague law. This is a, a permission to the police to arrest whoever they want and then say sorry afterwards if they feel the need to. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. On And I, I think this is important to note as well. I keep hearing people on the radio say, this was a momentous once-in-a-generation event. Well, that's precisely the kind of event where if you have said, oh, whoops, we, uh, we arrested you for 16 hours yeah. on the, the day which is okay. most relevant to your campaign. Okay. That, to me, seems I, pretty egregious. I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. The issue, really, for the police is how do they know which ones are going to set off rape alarms, which ones are going to glue themselves to the ground, which ones are going to run out in front of the horses. And it's making that judgment, which, at the moment it's made, is made by relatively junior constables. It's not made by the Commission of Metropolitan Police uh, 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 as the arrest is affected. Uh, well, I think... I mean, I think you might be expressing a bit of an authoritarian mindset there, because you're saying, if we can't know who's going to lock on, if we can't know who's going to throw paint, then we have to arrest people no, now I'm and ask saying, questions later, what, what especially I'm, if it's a high-profile event. What I'm event. saying is the police have to make a judgement, and inevitably, sometimes, they will get it wrong. But it's quite a fine judgement, and that one shouldn't be too harsh in criticism of them, uh, or, indeed, of giving them too loose a rein. It has to be a balance. Well, I think... I mean, where I do agree with you, actually, is I, I don't think necessarily the problem here was the police who did the arrests. I think we, you, you have a situation where there was quite a lot of political pressure to say there must be no disruption of this event. And by the way, these, the, the people from Republic weren't even planning to disrupt it. They were just going to hold up some signs and do some, see, some speeches. Not even next to where the coronation was taking place, in Trafalgar Square. So the coronation would have passed them by, but no-one's day would have been ruined, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think the pressure came from up top, right? So I don't think this was just some mistakes by some underqualified police. Obviously, the police have been planning this for a very long time. They weren't just willy-nilly sending out their least qualified people to say, oh, we'll arrest some people if you're a little bit worried. I think there was a clear message sent from the government, which was to say, we're rushing through the Public Order Act two days before the coronation precisely because we want you uh, to to do some heavy-handed policing, uh, and then I'd the be, police followed I'd suit. I'd be very surprised if there were direct political involvement. It would be against our political tradition, but... That's all from us. Up next, it's the great Dan Wooten. What sort of treats are on the menu tonight, Dan? Jacob, good evening. Well, we're following up lots of the brilliant stories that you've discussed, including Megyn Kelly from the US uh, reacting to the Trump verdict. But we've got an exclusive tonight. What on earth is going on at ITV? First, they describe the coronation as being terribly white. Now it looks like they've got rid of the loose women legend Carol McGiffin because of her views on COVID-19. So Carol McGiffin will be here to react to that ITV decision live. Well, that sounds extremely exciting, Dan. It's coming up uh, after the weather and I expect the sun is shining in Somerset, if nowhere else in the country. I will be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I'm Jake rees -Mogg, and this has been State of the Nation tonight. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here with your latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Today's lively downpours will ease overnight with some clear spells, especially towards the east, but further showers expected into Wednesday, Thursday 
And for some, on Friday as well, low pressure in charge at the moment. So that's what's bringing the mixture of sunny spells and showers. But there have been some very lively downpours and they'll continue to affect the southeast during Tuesday evening, eventually disappearing into the continent. Meanwhile, the next system pushes further cloud and showery rain into the west, but in the east, at least an interlude with clear spells for a time, mid to high single figures by dawn and a few mist patches as well. But otherwise plenty of sunshine for eastern Scotland away from the coast where it will be a fairly murky affair during the morning. And into eastern England, sunny skies for the first few hours at least. But the cloud and the showers in the west do migrate eastwards and they'll bubble up widely with again some slow moving, lively downpours and some thunderstorms. Temperatures up to the mid to high teens generally, perhaps a degree or so cooler compared with Tuesday, but not much in it. And where we do get some sunny spells, it will feel warm. High UV at this time of year when the sun does come out. But into the evening, well, that's when we see the cloud really break up as drier and clearer air arrives for a time. One exception towards the west, the where it will continue.